Joining us now is Dr. Lindsay P. Exit, Chief Economist at Stiefel, and Quincy Crosby, Chief Global Strategist for LPL Financial. Lindsay, I can say I knew you when. You were just like a regular person. Now you're a doctor. Congratulations, by the way, on that. Very cool. Um, we know the stock market is not the economy, but the stock market appears to be discounting some maybe bad things from the economy next year. What do you anticipate? I, I do think that the economy is going to face some sizable headwinds, even as we turn the calendar now into a new year. The consumer, particularly, under mounting pressure. Now, we did see some welcomed resilience in the fourth quarter, but against the backdrop of elevated inflation, persistent negative income growth, and a reluctance from many on the sidelines to move back into the labor market in a more traditional factor, I, I do think that we are going to see consumers slow markedly as we move into the first half of 2023. And so this is likely to result in a technical recession. Now, I do say that, but I, I want to add the caveat that it's likely to be a somewhat shallow and short-lived recession. But nevertheless, I do expect growth to turn back into negative territory as we look out to 2023. Hoping to have some good news here. Quincy, I mean, uh, I, I get, <laughs> listen, I, I guess maybe I should call you Quincy MD. That was a fantastic show. Like, I don't know when last time the markets returned this kind of stuff. Um, the market is discounting what we just talked about. I guess the question for our viewers and investors is, has the market already sold off enough to compensate for some kind of recession and or severe drop in corporate earnings? I think you nailed it on the corporate earnings. Uh, you know, the market is, as we all have said, talking about a recession. We don't know what kind. We expect it to be mild with all the information we have now. But in terms of corporate earnings, the expectations are that you're going to see margin compression over the next couple of of earnings uh, reports, and that that is going to lead to a meltdown in the market, the kind that historically you need to push the VIX up and then to leave us with compelling evaluations. Then, at the same time, what we do mm. believe is that the Fed is, the Fed is transitioning toward the end. Right now, the Fed funds futures market even has 25 basis points, 63% probability for February 1st, and then again for the next meeting in, in March, and one cut in 2023. But, but, but if, Quincy, let me jump in if I can. Yeah. Let me, sorry, let me jump yeah. in if I can, because with the NASDAQ down, I had all those nasty, ugly numbers at the top of the show, which, by yeah. the way, I'm yeah. sorry, folks, don't shoot the messenger. You know, 33% yeah. drop of the NASDAQ, that's multiple compression. I understand the E is going to change, so the denominator changes the whole thing. But when do we reach peak bottom in market valuation then? Well, you know, you have to go to the data. The historical data shows it's not going to be 17 times forward earnings. It usually is down to maybe 16 or even 15 times if it's a you know, strong recession. But this is what history dictates. Supposing the Fed does the proverbial pivot and basically says, OK, we're going to pause. We're going to be patient. Remember, they said that January 4th, 2019, the market just took off dramatically. But we, are, we don't know that the Fed is going to do that. We expect them to keep going. And therefore, the market is waiting for the market to completely discount the margin compression, the slower earnings, mm -hmm. and also consumer spending yeah. to slow down. And, Lindsay, you don't I, see it now. I see you nodding, Lindsay. Well, I, I actually would argue that the market is underestimating how high the Fed yes. is going to need to raise rates to get inflation under control and reinstate price stability, which the chairman has told us time and time again is the bedrock of the economy. So right now, the market is looking for the first rate cut to come by the end of the, the new year, by the end of 2023. The Fed may be raising rates not only to a higher level than the market anticipates, but may need to keep rates at that elevated level for much longer than the market anticipates. So that spells out further trouble, further downward pressure for risk assets. Quincy, you agree on that? I mean, Powell's going to... Of course, they've been wildly wrong about everything, the Fed. I'm yeah. sorry, a year ago, their, their, their forward projections, yeah. a.k.a. the dot plots, were only 5% yes. off. Yes. I mean, it, it's it's exactly. Anyway, without getting into criticism of the Federal Reserve, yeah. do you think they're going to have to now no. show how tough they are? No, I think, look, they're as data dependent as is the market. Right? They went through the transitory phase and then basically 
you know, uploaded the, the, uh, the rate hikes. They'll probably go to 25 basis points, at least the second uh, rate hike in, uh, in 2023. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is the other thing they're focused on is wages. That's something that he has mentioned over and over again and in terms of price stability that you cannot have a healthy economy, a healthy labor market without price stability. And those yeah. wage hikes actually move in the wrong direction. And they are going to make sure that they move in the right direction, coming down and then having the equilibrium in the labor market that they want. Because and guess what? Wages are an input cost. And they're being passed along to the consumer. That's right. That's right. And, and by the way, the only, I mean, I, listen, you guys yeah. are the experts. But I, I don't know any time where the only way to bring down labor costs with higher rates is mm -hmm. to get people fired. I mean, that, that's yes. they, you're going to have to lay off millions of people because once you give somebody a raise, generally you're not going to say, you know what, Miss Crosby, I got that wrong. I'm going to take it back. You just got to lay people off and then hire new people yeah. at a cheaper rate. All right. I was tweeting last night and I, I at, you know, Twitter limits polls to only four. So I put in the four things I thought, Lindsay. I said, what's the main reason? Pick one, not, you know, it's a combination. I know. The main reason you think costs surged this year. I had COVID supply chains, government spending, Federal Reserve, which I understand is kind of related, and labor costs. I didn't leave it. Somebody said, what? all these people are like, why didn't you put in corporate greed? Corporate greed's always been there. Corpor corporations are greedy. That's why they exist. All right, 52% of our respondents said it was government spending was the main cause of inflation, Lindsay and Quincy, first you, Lindsay, do you agree or disagree? I think the inflation equation came from both sides. On, on the one hand, yes, I would agree that the international supply chain disruptions added to that supply side nature of inflation. But to add insult to injury, we had this massive expansionary fiscal policy, which ignited the demand side of inflation. And so going forward, while we are seeing improvements in supply chain disruptions, we continue to see yeah. expansionary fiscal policy, which is pushing against the intention of monetary policy making it, again, increasingly difficult for yeah. the Fed to rein in inflation going forward. Yeah, I probably obviously have a little follower bias here. People watch CNBC follow me on Twitter. It's not the average general public. Quincy, 52 percent say it's the government spending. That's the main reason for inflation. Yes or no? Well, yes. Look at look at money supply. That's look it. at Milton M2. Friedman. That, well, that's, that happens to be it. And now what we're looking for is for M2 to start coming down more quickly because that will then, you know, drain the inflationary, expansionary money supply. It is coming down, but it needs to come down more quickly, and it will.